Well, friends, let's get to it. If you have your Bibles, meet me in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 6 all the way through 18. While you're turning there, another exciting thing that has happened. We're making Jesus famous the other six days, and our first initiative was to open a brand new preschool. And because of your sacrifice and your generosity, that preschool is built out. In fact, go take a look someday. It's state of the art. We think it's the best facilities for a preschool in the Coachella Valley, but that's because of your sacrifices. We've been struggling to get her open because we've been struggling with the licensing process. Can I get a state of California witness out there? Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I'm so happy to announce to you that as of Friday, it is official. We are fully licensed. Our preschool opens on October 9th. So we'll be blessing those babies the other six days of the week. Back in our series, This Is Us, 2 Timothy's call to discipleship. Uh, discipleship is the heart and soul of 2 Timothy, so that's the heart and soul of the church as well. And of course, when we define discipleship here, biblically, we define it this way. It's the call of the gospel to produce reproducing followers of Jesus Christ through life on life engagement. So everyone looking this way, let me announce you that Jesus is dreaming a dream over your life that by the time you're done, you will be able to look back at generations of disciples that came to saving faith and were brought up in maturity because of your witness to them and their lives. When we say discipleship, that's what we mean. We're walking through Discipleship University. We're checking off our boxes on our cards because we're going to get a PhD in discipleship, baby, okay? And we're excited about where God has taken us. By the end of the series, we want you to be able to answer this question. Will I make a great commitment to the Great Commission this year? Why is this such a big deal for us at our church? Because we believe that getting involved in discipleship is how we change the world. So last week we were talking about the first responsibility of discipleship is, is love. In other words, you need to be in a discipleship relationship. It is, a, it is the ball game for you. Every person here who is a mature believer, okay, you know your stuff. You should be praying to Jesus every day saying, Jesus, who in our church or who in my community or who at my place of work do you have for me to pour into and do life-on-life -life discipleship with, okay? Tonight at 8 o'clock, me and my 11 guys, okay, will be right around my fire pit, all right? We're going to open up God's Word. We're going to pray. We're going to make fun of each other because we usually do that. And then we're going to just confess our sins and we're going to have communion together. That happens a few times a month with me and my guys. Who are your guys? Okay? That's what we want. That's what the Bible teaches us. This is how Jesus changed the world. Jesus had 12. If you're a mature believer, who's your 12? If you are a new believer, or maybe you're not even a Christian yet and you're still checking this Christian stuff out, you should be saying, God, what is the, who is the Paul out there that you have to pour into me so that I could be nurtured in the faith and brought up? So when we say discipleship, we're talking about everybody. No one's left out of what God wants to do in the world. So uh, it's love, right? Nobody cares what you know till they know that you care. There's a lot of things you can do alone. Christianity ain't one of them, okay? You need to be connected to somebody to show you the ways of Jesus. So we said it this way last week. You need to have a Paul who is ahead of you, been there and done that. You need to have a Timothy who's behind you. You need to plant them. And you need to have a Barnabas beside you who is doing life. This is God's vision for us. Now we go to the second responsibility of disciple making. I think Paul would say that it's leadership. So we talked about the Paul ahead of you. And the question I want to answer today is, when I get a Paul, and ladies, when I get a Pauline, what does he look like? What does she look like? What are they doing? What are they saying to me, okay? How do I know I have the right kind of Paul? And also, how do I know I'm being the right kind of Paul in someone else's life? That's kind of where we want to go today. Now, last week, Paul was encourager. He was, hey, Timothy, I love you, dude. You're my little bro, okay? Man, I got you. So last week was grace, but this week is truth. Last week, Paul was saying to Timothy, I love you just as you are. This week, he's saying, I refuse to leave you where you are. And he shows to us that need that all of us have to have somebody outside of us who's challenging us to be the person God has created us to be. So I'm just going to read uh, from verses 6 through about uh, verse um, 8. In fact, uh, staff, I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm just going to read those first three verses. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Hear now the word of the Lord. Paul says to Timothy, for this reason... 
I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Good morning, church. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Don't you know? I've read from the greatest book ever written, and I bear witness this day that all of its words are true. Amen? Amen. I want to tell you a story about what a big old mega church uh, in the Midwest learned a few years ago. Huge mega church. Now, Southwest is technically a mega church, but we are megabyte next to this church. They are gigabyte. They are huge, okay? In the Midwest, in fact, if you've come up in church, if I said the name of this church, you would know the name of this church. You two would definitely know the name of this church. Um, famous church, written books, done all sorts of great things. And this church is heyday. They had over 30,000 members, um, 15, 16 campuses all around the region. Uh, they had a 1,000 person staff, okay? a 1,000 people on staff. At their height, their budget their annual budget for a church was $63 million a year. I'm like, low key, can y'all let us hold 20? You know what I'm saying? But anyways, big, big old rich church, and they're amazing, right? They do great things, um, state-of-the-art ministries, cutting-edge programs, uh, facilities unmatched. So they had a playground for every age group on every campus, and these guys had uh, baseball fields and softball fields and soccer fields and football fields, you name it, they had it. Uh, they had uh, the cafe, you know how you go in the big churches and they got the cafe, where you get a cappuccino and it, they make it, the, the foam look like a little leaf on it, so you, it was a leaf cafe, you could come in and get all, all the bells and whistles. That's not all. This church had inside of it an auto mechanic shop. Like literally, you go in there and be seven, eight cars lifted up. You heard a fire stone, they had church stone. Okay, I don't know what they call it. But anyway, they, they had all this on the inside. Um, they even had a miniature grocery store on the inside of the church. So you name it, this church had the bells and whistles. Well, several years ago, they did a survey to kind of capture how well they were doing at people who had been there for at least 20 years. So everybody who had been at the church 20 years had to do this survey to see how they had experienced the church. And when they got the results, this church was flabbergasted to realize that over and over and over again, the people said the only thing that was missing was a challenge. Now, over and over again, they said, cafe with a little leaf is real cool. And we love having soccer fields, and we love that it's an auto mechanic shop in the church. But as we look back over 20 years, we think, Pastor, you could have challenged us more to be what God wants us to be. As we tiptoe to the passage, Paul is reminding Timothy that it's not the playgrounds and the cafes that's going to strengthen you, but it's the presence of a Paul in your life that you've given license to, to challenge you to be what God has called you to be. And in so doing, he shows us the second step in disciple making, does he not? It's to entrust your life to another spiritual leader, a disciple maker, a mentor, a gospel parent that helps you do what God has called you to do. I want to walk through the text. And so doing, I want to give up these three messages your Paul should constantly be preaching to you. Table of contents for our time. A gospel Paul will constantly say, don't get comfortable, don't fear, and don't give up. I'd like to tag this text, lead. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, thank you so much for this sweet congregation. Move mightily through your spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name and every heart said, amen. amen. You're at a few minutes of church? Amen. amen. All right. Eight, eight of us? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let, let, let's go to the classroom for a few minutes, and I promise we're going to church. Let's start off with like a word uh, on our passage. I would say to you that when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm, I'm kind of covering 6 through 18 today, okay? But when you come to this passage, I, I would say that this is a tell-all on the conversation that's supposed to be happening between you and the people who mentor you. That this is a tell-all on the conversations that should be happening between you 
and the person you're trusting to lead you spiritually in your life. Paul's doing all sorts of stuff in this long passage, a lot of encouragement, right? Uh, He says that uh, Jesus Christ has brought to death and life to immortality in the gospel, and he says that he has abolished death, and he's praising God for his salvation. At another point, I think it's verse 14, I believe, maybe it's 12, but Paul says to Timothy in encouragement, I know whom I have believed. Now, remember, if you've been tracking with us, Paul's in a 20-foot hole about to be executed, but his head is not unbowed. He's not nearly ready to give up. Why? Because he knows in whom he has believed. Translation, Paul is not resting his eternity on what he knows, but in who he believes in. And somebody needed to hear today that you, life has backed you into a catch-22. You don't know what your next step is, and you're thinking, maybe I need this knowledge, and maybe I need this method, and maybe I ought to check out this book, and maybe I need this seminar. And although all those things are well and good, I've come to remind you that on Christ, the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Paul is in a hole, still assured that even in a hole, if the hole takes me out, Jesus will welcome me in because I know in whom I have believed. I want to encourage you this week, as long as you have Jesus, you don't need anybody else. As long as you know Jesus, you don't need nothing else. Stay with Jesus. Keep your faith in Jesus. Put your hopes in Jesus. I bear witness that the Lord Christ can bring you through. I know in whom I have believed. So in many ways, Paul is still encouraging Timothy, right? Like he's still saying, hey, Jesus got you and I got you and it's going to be all good. So there's a lot of tenderness here. But more than anything, don't you see there's toughness? Like there's, there's, some, there's some just tough Love. I mean, low key, y'all. I'm telling y'all, Paul is just saying, man up. Like Paul is saying, bruh, put your big boy pants on. Wipe your tears, son. Let's go. Can I go to the ladies? Girl, you better fix your makeup and get yourself together. Because God's got a destiny, God's got a plan for you. And yeah, you get a season to cry and you get a season to whine, but after a while, you, you need to woman up too and do what God has called you to do. Ricky, show me in the Bible. I'm so glad you asked. Verse six, fan into flame the gift of God. In Mississippi, that means man up. Verse seven, what does he say? God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. What does that mean in Mississippi? Get over yourself. God got you. Let's move in what God has called you to do. Verse 8, share in suffering for the gospel of God. In other words, we're going to have hard times and trial and tribulation. But how many of you know that God's gospel goes forth even better in suffering than it does in peacetime? He's saying, man up, bro. We got this. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. He says, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. He says, follow the pattern of the sound word that you have seen in me. He is basically saying, apparently, you and I need somebody older and wiser and more godlier to call us out on our stuff to stop being mamby-pamby, thumb-sucking Christians and suck it up and get up and move on with your life and do what God has called you to do. You ain't got to say amen, but somebody should have said amen right there. You need that in your life. So that's what's going on in our passage, this idea that apparently we need somebody in our lives who's ready to challenge us and ready to direct us and ready to admonish us. And here's the principle. I think every believer ought to have another believer they're submitted to. I think every believer ought to have another. Guys, there has to be somebody outside of you that's got a little more sense on the day you ain't got no sense. Come on, somebody say amen. Like, who's that person in your life? My mom was one of 12. And they lived in inner city, downtown Jackson, Mississippi. They lived in the hood, okay? The ghetto. And they lived out right there in the hood, and there were always drunks and thugs walking by the street. And my mother used to say, it didn't even matter if the person that you need in your life is older than you. They just need to have more sense. 
So my mom would say, yeah, Ricky, all 12 of us kids would be out in the front yard and a drunk or a drug dealer would come up to the yard and trouble was on the way. My mama would say, baby, you didn't listen to whoever was the oldest. You listened to whoever had the most sense. And you need someone in your life who has more sense on the days you have no sense. Anybody kind of tracking with me here? You need that person in your life. Do you know the reason they say that two minds are better than one? Because you need a person in your life who has kept their mind when you have lost yours. Amen, somebody. You just need somebody who still got some sanity when you have gone insane. You need somebody who can still see straight when you're still seeing crooked. You got to have this in your life. This is true. Remember David and Bathsheba? King David on top of the world miscellaneously discovers a woman next door on the top of her roof taking a bath, aptly named Bathsheba. <laughs> Splish splash, she was taking a bath <laughs> all upon a Saturday night. Y'all remember this story? David sleeps with the girl. He, he knocks her. He got her knocked up, won't let me. Anyways, okay, she, he got her pregnant, okay? had her husband killed. And here's the thing about it. David had lost his spiritual mind so much that he didn't even think it was a big deal. And he's moving on in his life thinking ain't nothing happened. He has a big brother in the faith, the prophet Nathan, comes into David's court and comes up with this dramatic story saying, there's this rich guy that has all these sheep and all these herds. And guess what? That rich guy went and abused the poor guy and took the only one lamb that that little guy had. David's furious. David can't believe it. And David's mad about to call the whole army after this guy. He says, well, tell me who that man is. Nathan looks at him and says, you the man. You need a Nathan in your life that's not impressed with you, who can call you out and say, you are the man. Are you or the woman? Remember what we said? Sin stays longer when isolation gets stronger. So in the passage, this is what the Apostle Paul is doing, is showing the power of a Paul. Hard work matters. Attitude matters. Dedication matters. Endurance matters. Consistency matters. And even though we know those things, how many of you know that it's true that sometimes the only reason we ascend to those virtues is because someone else challenged us to ascend to them? You need that in your life. And this is one of the reasons I want to double down why we need it. Ours is a culture where excellence is no longer the goal, easiness is. Culture today... We, we, we're not, we're only concerned with how little we can do as opposed to how well we're supposed to do it. Amen, somebody? Can I say something harsh? We lazy. Amen? I've heard, I've heard the youngsters, all right? I've heard them, and some of them ain't that young. Yeah, pastor, I just don't like my job because, man, I come home so tired. And low-key, I'm like, it's a job. You ain't supposed to come home refreshed. <laughs> Low key, I'm like, too many Christians are going to come into heaven already relaxed and already rested. Friend, let me tell you something. You're supposed to be tired. It's supposed to be hard. That's why we call it work and not buffet. <laughs> Amen, somebody. We, 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 we didn't just got lazy. Tony Evans said what too many believers are doing today is they're auditing the Christian life. Anybody remember when you were in college and you needed to audit a course? When you audit a course, all you got to do is receive the information. But the thing is, you ain't got to pass no tests. You ain't got to show up on time. You ain't even got to read the book. Because when you signed up to audit, all you agreed to do was get all the information, but none of the responsibility. Tony says, we got too many believers auditing the church. You showing up, can I go there now? But you ain't passing none of the tests. You ain't reading the book. You just showing up to get all the information and none of the responsibility. And sometimes you just need somebody to challenge you to do what God has called you to do. Y'all with me so far? 
Okay, if you're leaving the church, don't leave till next week. We'll be fine, okay? It's all good. But I just want to encourage a culture that has gotten lazy. And I want to encourage households who forgot the, the virtue of hard work and determination. I want to remind us that these are time-honored, time-proved um, uh, virtues that we don't need to let go of, okay? So at the end of the day, you need someone to do that. Now, when that person comes in your life, three things and we'll get out of here. What is your Paul in your life saying? The first thing he's saying to you is don't get comfortable. Everybody say, don't get comfy. All right, P.T. Barnum said that, that comfort is the enemy of progress, okay? Uh, this is old school wisdom, y'all okay? All right, this is old school, okay? Um, if you ever wanna stop growing, get comfortable. If you ever wanna stop learning, get comfortable. Can I go further? If you wanna stop making more money, now we're listening, get comfortable. If you ever wanna stop making an impact, get comfortable. Comfort is the enemy of progress, but for too many of us, comfort is the goal. Okay, let me tell you something. You got a whole eternity that's gonna be very comfortable. For now, God calls you to roll up your sleeves and do what he's called you to do. And so that's what we see happening in the text. Paul is saying to Timothy, don't get comfortable. And notice in verse six, he says, fan of the flame, the gift of God which is already in you through the laying on of my hands. Now that gift we think is the preaching ministry that Timothy would have been given. Remember, Timothy is a fledgling pastor. He's stifled by the opposition around him. He's worried, sick, if you will. And, but what is Paul saying the answer to complacency is? Do what God has called you to do. In other words, Paul is saying to Timothy, if God's called you to preach, you're supposed to be preaching. If God's called you to serve, you're supposed to be serving. If God's called you to open a business, you're supposed to be opening a business. If God's called you to contribute and give, you're supposed to be contributing and giving. Can I go further? If God's called you to marry that boy, you're supposed to marry that boy. Can I do one that this church may need to hear even more? If God's called you not to marry that boy. Somebody's supposed to say amen right there. I'd rather you be alone and happy than with a fool and sad. But whatever God's called you to do, do it. And I think what, where, where Paul is going is that there seems to be this tendency in culture where if God's given me a gift, God's given me a ministry, God's given me a burden, there's something about the 2023 person that's willing to wait until magic happens and someone else recognizes you and someone else builds a platform for you and someone else manicures a, a little pristine, beautiful path in the way where you'll have no challenges and no hardship whatsoever. God told me to tell you, you don't need anyone to agree with what God has gifted you for but God. You don't need anybody else to tell you you're good at it. You don't need anybody else to tell you that that's you and that's not you. If God be in you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We got too many mamby-pamby, thumb-sucking Christians. I can sing, but no one's ever asked me. We ain't never gonna ask it. I can preach and I got a preaching gift, but they ain't never even, they never even recognize me. We ain't never gonna do it either. Amen? But if you got the gift, it's your responsibility to share that I've got a gift and I can serve and I can contribute. I get emails all the time. Hey, Pastor Rick, I've been at the church for a couple of years and I just believe God's called me to preach and just offering myself up to come and preach on stage on Sunday. And I'm like, and your name is? Don't even know him. I said, okay, brother, well, let's get together, you know? We'll have a conversation, we'll be talking. It's like, okay, man, well, let's start nurturing this gift. But hey, you know what? Coachella Valley Rescue Mission is right there. Amen. About 40, 50 guys, they're ready. Oh, no, pastor, that's not my calling. I thought you were called to preach, amen? So why would God trust you with a 5,000 stage if you won't honor him with a 50-person stage? Amen? Do you know how many times I've been to Macomb, Mississippi to preach to four people? More than I can count. 
and you, wouldn't, you shouldn't even want a pastor preaching to you who didn't honor God with four people. Amen, Amen somebody. Because if God would have gave me 5,000 too quick, how many of you know that I wouldn't have the character to sustain what God gave me? So maybe God doesn't have you on a holding pattern. Maybe you're in a disobedience pattern. God's like, I'll give you a platform. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. But why would I give you a Rolls Royce if you won't honor me with a Camry? Amen? Fan in the flame the gift of God. And I think we need to say this to this culture. Listen to this. You don't need a platform to be a Christian. You just don't. You can be salt and light right now. Y'all okay? I feel heat. I feel heat. I feel heat. We okay? And what is a trainer supposed to do? They're supposed to say, don't get comfortable. Y'all know me. Y'all, y'all, y'all see my issues. We all know it. I've got a weight problem. We all know this. We all know this. We've all seen it. Okay? We know it. I'm up or I'm down. We've all seen it. We know what's going on with me, okay? One year, I'm Big Luther. The next year, I'm Little Luther. We've all seen this, okay? Can I get another Big Luther, Little Luther witness if that's been your thing, okay? It's just my thing. And, and it finally hit me in April this summer. It's just like, you know what? I apparently can't do this by myself. I can't. I got to get help. So I partnered with a trainer, and he's great. I'm down 20 pounds. I'm down 20 pounds. Now listen, I can't even celebrate it because you know you fat. When you lose 20 pounds and your clothes don't get looser, they just fit. (laughs) People be saying, Ricky, are your clothes getting looser? No, no, I just, I can just get in them now. But anyways, (laughs) but I got this trainer, he's coming over a little home gym and he's great and he's methodical, but man, I feel like there's moments where it's just like, this feels a little torturous. Like, he, he makes me do these, what's, what's these things called? Um, squats. <laughs> you know, I'll be having me doing this stuff. And then, guys, I got to hold a weight up. You know, I'm just looking like a Smurf with mine. You know, and I'm just looking. And low-key, I'll be like, man, r- r- bro, we did like 20 of them. When you going to stop? You know, and he'll just keep on counting and keep on going. And it's just funny. He'll be like, oh. He'll be right here. Here's my ear. Come on, Ricky. Let's keep going. Ten more, buddy. Ten for God. Nine for Jesus. Eight for the Holy Spirit. Seven for the Bible. Six for April. Five for the children. Four for Southwest. Two for the Coachella. And I'm like, can I get a break for me? (laughs) Through all this stuff. But he just keeps talking. And y'all know I'm a little dramatic. A little dramatic. My first week, I was so hot and bothered. Y'all know how your neighbors got the landscape and water, and they pour the water out, and it collects in the, the little curbs, and the water runs down. Y'all, I was so hot and bothered, I put my face in the irrigation. Look, look it's just for proof. <laughs> Y'all, I put my Jordan River chili and cold. Chilled my body, but not my soul, y'all. And then, then a couple of weeks, you think you're going to get better. Because he's still like, nine for the Holy Spirit, eight for the Trinity, seven for the Bible. And you know, I'm thinking I'm going to be better. It's just as hard. Look at what happened last week. I just, but here's the thing. Watch this. Because he stays in my ear, I'm leaner, I'm stronger. I feel good. And guess what else? I don't read the Bible any more than I did a month ago. But I'm spiritually better because it's all connected. Amen? The last thing you want your trainer to say is nothing. Because it's only through the message of don't get comfortable that you move forward in your life. Can y'all say amen to that? Okay. Let's close on this. Uh, number two, don't get, don't, they tell you don't fear. You need the big brother, big sister in the faith who's saying, don't worry, God will be with you. You need that person who's saying, don't worry, I know you're scared, but God will be with you. Don't worry, I know it's going to be hard to go call that out, but God will be with you. You need somebody in your life who doesn't feel it like you feel it, so with confidence they can say, God will be with you. Don't fear, don't fear, 
Don't fear. God's going to be with you. You've got to have that pastor. You've got to have that shepherd, somebody who loves Jesus more than they love you, who's constantly saying, don't fear. So Paul says to Timothy, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. You need somebody who's licensed to echo this truth into your soul. Because how many of you know you believe it on good days and you forget it on bad ones? And you need someone who remembers it on your bad day. Now, underline that word fear, okay? Two usual suspects in the Greek language for the word fear. The first is the Greek word phobos, from which we derive our English word phobia, okay? So think arachnophobia means I'm scared of spiders. Like it means boo. It means fright. It means, oh my gosh, I'm worried. You know, it's that kind of fear. But that's not the word in this passage. The word in this passage is the Greek word delios. Delios means timidity, okay? It's speaking to Timothy's shyness in what God is calling him to do. He must have had a sheepish spirit. He's got to preach to people who don't want to hear it. So the issue, watch this, because you got to get it. The issue was not that Timothy was not being a witness. The issue was that Timothy was not being a bold witness. Amen? See, when you're living right and you're somebody's Paul, you ought to be willing to look in their eyes and say, you're going to get it together in Jesus' name. I had a guy uh, last year that was struggling, and he was thinking about getting a divorce, and it was just real hard. And I looked at him, and I said, the only way y'all get a divorce is if you come to my living room and win the fight. That's a quote. He said, I'm not going to let you quit. Don't fear. God's got you. Who's that Nathan in your life? You need that. So he's saying, it's not that you're not being a witness. He's saying you're not being a bold witness, okay? And he's saying that people receive your message better when they know you believe it, when you know you have confidence in it, when you know how you have faith. In fact, I dangle participles every weekend, okay? We all know that I'm not the most precise communicator in the world, but I think God uses his preachers and his leaders and his people that to remind us that somebody else still believes it. So I'll still believe it too. Amen? Amen? So the problem was that he wasn't being a bold witness. It was the presentation that was faltering. And how many of you know that presentation is everything? Yeah. Right? So how you present yourself and how you present the good news is just as important as the content of the good news. People see these things. Remember back in the day when we can talk about the Cosby show and it was still okay? Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Let's act like we're still there. Okay? Right? Let's act like we're still there. There's an episode of the Cosby show, and Vanessa, 19-year-old girl, brings home this dude who's 40 years old, and she's gotten engaged to him. And Dr. Huxville, Heathcliff Huxville, are they just mad? And Claire, they're just mad. Because how dare you, 19-year-old, introduce to us this 40-year-old man that you didn't got engaged to? And so they're just mad. His name was Dabness Bricky. And Dabness couldn't understand why her parents couldn't receive her. And, and Cliff's trying to explain that it's, it's not you. It's the, way she, it's the way she brought you to me. So she looks, he looks at her and says, well, do you, do, you, do you have a favorite food? And Dabney says, well, I love steak. He says, steak, got it. And, you know, <laughs> he turns it on. So he's looking at her, he says, Dabney, imagine if I had a juicy steak. And I got the steak on the flame broiled, and it's the tomahawk ribeye, and it's got all the spices and the herbs, and it's got the butter and the heat, and it's got the baked potato and the sour cream and all the butter and the chives and the bacon bits, and I got it next to the mashed potato and the gravy, and then I got the pudding and the pops and the pudding, whoa, and he just, he just turned it on. He says, yes, sir, I would love that. And he says, well, imagine if I got that same meal, took it off the plate, and put it on a garbage can lid, and then said, eat that. Would you want to eat it? I said, of course not. He's like, it's not you. It's how she brought you to me that makes it hard for me to accept. And God told me to tell some of us that it's not you. It's how you're bringing him to the people in your life that makes it tough for people to accept. Don't be timid, amen? amen. Let's go home. Don't... Um, Get comfortable, don't fear, and last thing they'll just tell you, don't give up. Verse 8 says, share in suffering, and for the gospel of God, and what I want you to see here is that Paul is unapologetically refusing to shield Timothy from the reality that he'll have hard times living for Jesus. 
okay? This is what I want you to hear. One of the greatest gifts you'll ever give your disciples is reality. You know why our children are acting crazy today? Mom and daddy didn't give them reality. You know what we got for the first time in recorded American history? Employees or employers, managers and supervisors who for the first time in recorded history are complaining not about their employees but about their employees' parents because we never gifted them reality. Supervisors around the nation are starting to complain that it's not just their worker that's the problem but it's their mama and daddy calling the boss saying, how dare you discipline my child on their job. And you know what this means? Those parents didn't gift their child with reality. And as you make disciples, and as someone's discipling you, the best thing they can do for you is let you know it will be tough. It will be hard. But God will have you, okay? This is one of the things I want you to hear, and we'll go home on this. When you fail to give the people you lead reality, you don't spare them from pain. You double it. When you don't give people reality, you don't spare them. You're not helping them. You're doubling their pain. Let me put it this way. I used to date this girl back in my 20s, and her name was um, crazy. <laughs> that was her name. It was crazy. Anybody else date crazy too? Over here, you date crazy. I dated crazy. Um, uh, back in my 20s, I was a youngster, but I dated crazy. And have you ever dated anybody that was crazy, and you knew ahead of time that they crazy, and you dated them anyway? And then when they started acting crazy, you couldn't even be mad, because after all, they was crazy. Amen? Amen? So I dated crazy, and it was just one of those things. Love this girl, crazy about this girl. And of course, she eventually acted crazy, because last time I checked, crazy people, crazy. That's what they, that's what they, it's like, the, do y'all remember Siegfried and Roy? You better remember the magicians. They used to mess around with the tigers. You know them? Remember when one of the tigers bit Roy? Remember that? He got bit on his neck, I think, by, by one of his tigers. And remember how the whole world got mad at the tiger? And everybody was just typing in saying, that tiger is savage. And they were saying crazy stuff like, the tiger went crazy, you know. And in the words of the prophet Chris Rock, that tiger did not go tiger, or did not go crazy. That tiger went tiger. That tiger bit somebody. And last time I checked, what tigers do is they bite somebody. So I was dating a tiger that went tiger, okay? So she's cheating on me, no respect, bad attitude, finally break it off, we're done. And I'm telling one of my friends, dude, we finally broke it off. He's like, oh, thank God. I'm like, what? What you talking about? He's like, thank God, man, I knew it was not gonna work. I was like, are you serious? He's like, bro, we knew it, man. She was cheating on you and everything. Bro, we were in Oakland, so you call each other blood in Oakland. I said, blood, why, why didn't you tell me? And he says, bro, we, we just didn't want to hurt you. But do you see how he hurt me twice? Because I got hurt from the reality, but then I got hurt by the fact that someone who loved me didn't courageously tell me about it. When you keep people from reality, you don't spare them from pain. You double it. So if you're going to be a good parent and a good grandparent and a good Paul and a good mentor and a good leader and a good teacher and a good boss and a good supervisor and a good whatever it is, your job is to embrace reality and get your disciples to embrace it as well. Does that make sense? Amen. Nine times out of ten, the reason you didn't tell them about reality, because you value your comfort more than their success. And that's a sin before God. And so what does it mean for us to be the Paul that we need to be? in the same way we want our Paul to be in our lives. Amen? Amen. Okay, raising canes or whatever you're going to do, enjoy it. Open up your hands like this before we go. Jesus, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much, God, for what you're doing. Father, I pray that you would help us to go find a Paul, and I pray that you would help us to be the Paul for somebody else. 
Jesus, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you, I pray that even now they would whisper those words of faith. Jesus, come into my life. I repent of all my sins. Make me whole. I put my faith in what you accomplished for me on the cross, and I'm yours from now on. And help me to be a Paul and a Barnabas and a Timothy, God, to your glory. Father, bless us to be a disciple-making church. And until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lifts up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. I ask this blessing in the name of our Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And amen. God bless y'all. Have a great week, everybody. God bless you.